So we're right on time here at 1 p.m., starting uh, uh, with a uh, faculty panel that I'm just as excited to introduce as I was to introduce Dr. Boyd. Um, I'm going to switch the uh, lineup slightly in one respect. You have uh, four names here. Um, I'm going to put Harry Lewis last to bat cleanup, um, uh, but otherwise we'll go in that order. Um, and I'll introduce uh, briefly the uh, panel and hopefully um, uh, uh, they will each speak some and, and we'll reserve some time for uh, questions. Please do raise your hand at any point. I think we should just keep this interactive if you guys are okay with that. Um, uh, first up is Nancy Kane, the James E. Robeson Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. She has a wonderful topic that I'm going to let her describe in greater detail, although it's written in your program. Um, I've gotten to know uh, somewhat the work of uh, Nancy and her colleagues at the Business School in the context of knowledge management. I actually think that the place in which so much of the most interesting interesting work um, thinking about how information is changing and how um, we think about knowledge is happening in the context of the Harvard Business School. Um, and you can follow uh, Nancy, as you can see it, at Nancy Kane on Twitter. She's doing it herself, so she speaks um, from great experience. Um, next to her is uh, Professor uh, Gregory Mankiw, Professor um, in uh, economics. He also has the um, best known, if not best selling, uh, textbook in economics, I think, um, and a blog that is equally important, as we'll hear, um, to his teaching. Uh, as that textbook is. Um, going down to the end, uh, Professor Michael Sandel, the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University. Um, I uh, got to know Professor Sandel from a seat very distant from the stage of Sanders Theater in Justice um, in the um, <laughs> early 1990s um, and have admired his work ever since that. His current students in Justice have um, many other ways to interact with Professor Sandel than from the nosebleed seats in Sanders. Um, and those students now include a much broader audience around the world by virtue of some really ambitious and interesting work that combines social media and frankly traditional media like television uh, in ways that is totally fascinating and much to the credit both of Professor Sandel and the university uh, in terms of what um, has happened. Um, and bad in cleanup is um, uh, Harry Lewis, um, the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science in uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, also the former dean of Harvard College. I think may be safe to say that without Dean Lewis there might not have been a Facebook even. Um, there are <laughs> some interesting stories there. Um, but because of uh, any number of things, he gets the last word on this uh, particular panel. So uh, Nancy, over to you. Sure. So uh, thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Interesting moment, interesting topic. Um, in the business school way, I'm actually a historian. My PhD is in 18th century European history um, from, from this side of the river. And, but I need still, in the spirit of the business school, I need to start with some numbers. So there are 600 million registered users of Facebook. There will be a billion in less than six months. Um, la this year, Facebook's ad revenue is pro projected to be about $4 billion. In the first quarter of 2011, 31% of all online ad display ads appeared on Facebook at operating margins of about 50% for that company. That's pushed insider speculation about the market valuation of that company up to close to $100 billion. Just to give you a few more little tapas bar-like dishes in the same spirit, Dr. Pepper, which is a very popular Facebook corporate Facebook page has about eight and, a half, uh, eight and a half million registered users. Starbucks, another very popular Facebook page, gets a, has about 12 million registered fans. Coca-Cola's in the same ballpark, folks. Let's start with something really important. This is big, big business. This is big business with big money behind it. And we, we just need to keep that in our D drives or in our, our, our NF, NSF space or out in the cloud somewhere as we talk about this. This is big business. And there's more business models and more ways to turn this into ka-ching, ka-ching coming at us and our students and our good selves every day. That's the first musing. Second musing is we know a lot, we know, we know much less uh, than we think about this. Or what we don't know, perhaps a better way of saying it, is much, much greater than what we do. And so I need to offer as the historian in the group a couple of just um, an, an analogous moments. When the railroad first appeared as a possible mode of transportation back in the 1840s in this country, the early pictures of what a railroad car would look like were stagecoach cars on, on tracks. 
So that's what we thought the future was in 1840. And by the way, many, many, many railroads went bankrupt before we figured out how to create economies of scale and scope and what became the really the infrastructure of the mass market and, in, and modern industrialization. So that's the first flash. The second flash is that when the telephone was patented and then commercialized, it was done so primarily as an office intercom. Thirdly, I'm reading just all the gossipy, snarky bits in Paul Allen's new book, and he talks a lot about the Altair, the first computer in, that Ed, Jones and, uh, Ed, Ed Roberts and others in Albuquerque put together. That was going to be a hobbyist device, and it was going to be a big business as a hobbyist device. Fourth, in 1995, a guy named John Seabrook, who's really active in social media and writes for The New Yorker, published a fascinating article called Email from Bill. It was a series of email exchanges, 1995, with Bill Gates, in which John and Bill exalted the opportunities for learning and human development and effective time use and energy use through email. Fourth, in 2000, we thought that you could make a lot of money shipping furniture and large bags of dog food over the internet. So we don't really know how to use this. And we don't, we don't just know how to use it as a business. We don't really know how to use it as a communication device. We don't know how to use it in keeping with the better angels of our nature. We don't even know how to use it efficiently yet. And there is no doubt that we don't know that. That's the second musing. The third musing is that is from the Bishop of London. So I, I drank too much coffee on Thursday night, so I'm up at five and like I turn on the television. I don't even do the royals anymore. And, and, and there were many fascinating things about that wedding, including the huge disruption or d juncture between the cheerful and ebullient young people in the audience and the more dour but well-hatted VIPs along the transept. And, but one of the most interesting things was something the Bishop of London said in the middle of the service. And he began by saying the 21st century has great promise and it has great perils, perhaps greater than any that we can log in the last three or 400 years. But what will be needed to deal with the promise and particularly the perils is actually not more information and it's not even more connectivity. It will be the translation of that information and connectivity into loving wisdom, into understanding and into wisdom. So I think one of the interesting questions here is how do we as an academy think about the creation not just of knowledge but of understanding Right? And the important buttresses that have existed through many technological revolutions about, around the Cathedral of Higher Education, which is not just to prepare young people and, and all of us for the next way to you know, get and spend, as important as that is, getting and spending, getting and spending. It is also to help prepare our hearts and minds for a life of right action and, and, and astute judgment and, and a sense of the context and of our obligations and loyalty that play to our higher selves as well as the rest of us. So that means, leads me to my, my fourth musing, which is that I think in all this Schumpeterian creative destruction, because a lot of what Dana's talking about is about destruction, right? Hierarchies and old walls and barriers and models of learning and business models and social networks and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as Yul Brenner said in the King and I. Um, a lot of this creative destruction, I think, is forcing us in the academy back to some kind of relooking, rethinking, maybe, you know, reconfirmation or revalidation of our fundamental purpose and our fundamental mission. Um, fifth, and I'll say this in the spirit in which John introduced me, um, and I have only one more musing. Fifth, um, the technology, and you can see this really with glaring, just glaring clarity at the business school, is outstripping our learning models. So we have this model at the business school. And we, we're like, like the Beatles, we write all our own stuff. It's these black and white cases, right, with, that have all these exhibits. And we bring our students in, we ask them to read them in advance, and we do interesting things with social, social media around them, but we still fundamentally bring them into the classroom. And then we ask them questions. We don't lecture. And so we're depending on a whole bunch of things around your comment, around listening and, and judgment and you know, filtering and sifting and editing on the part of our students to generate a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts 
in the classroom and that we believe, or we once believed, we still do, has a big overhang into their lives and not just, we hope, into their, you know, their next Wall Street job. So, you know, we're, we're, we're getting outstripped real fast on this. And the Harvard Business School is, we are, we are really trying to pick up this gauntlet and deal with it. But we don't, we don't know exactly how to do that. Because we've had a model that's worked really well for 80 years, 80 or 90 years. So, so I think we're, 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 we're outpaced here. And I'm not surprised by that as a historian, but it only puts the, ups the ante, dials the volume up on the kind of conversations and then the kind of action we have to take. The last musing is, in that spirit, I think just like effective leadership in ongoing turbulence, we're going to need a lot of smart experimentation, rapid fire experimentation. We're going to need a lot of suppleness around how we try and use this with our students, right? But with what we bring to the table as faculty members and, and, and serious uh, seekers, and serious seekers, we're going, to have to, we're going to have to be engaged in rapid fire experimentation and suppleness of how we use that, and yet consistency of purpose, consistency of why we're doing what we're doing, and some real faith in our, in our ongoing ability, technology aside, to, to help students translate knowledge into understanding and understanding into knowledge. Nancy, that's totally wonderful. Please join me. <laughs> Before I turn it over to Professor Mankiw, just one comment on your fourth and fifth points, um, the Schumpeter points and so forth. I think one of the interesting things to reflect on about our business is the extent to which we are an information or knowledge business, however you want to define it. If you look at other information and knowledge businesses, like the um, telephone monopoly that AT&T had, if you look at the recording industries business, if you look at the movies business, if newspaper you look at business. newspaper most recently, um, increasingly these are businesses that have had some serious business model issues hit them in the last decade, right, um, or two. Uh, we have been remarkably untouched to date, at least at the um, sort of high level where we sit. I don't think that's particularly for long, whether it's at an individual level in the classroom or institutionally. And I think some of the things that I know Clayton Spencer and others are working on around strategic direction for the university are looking at this. How do we stay ahead of the curve? But I do think that it's going to come from individual faculty and individual classrooms and individual experimenters where we will come up with the percolating um, set of data from which we will derive Absolutely. those strategies. And I think it's really important that we not get too, um, I don't know, sort of comfy. Is it Absolutely on not. These world's greatest university type laurels that we. I mean, the University of Phoenix, just to take one example we're very familiar with at the business school, is, is just gunning, gunning, right? Gunning for a lot of what we do and very successfully, I might add. So just from a business model. All right, from a business dot, dot, model dot. to an economist, um, Gregory Menkew, please uh, let us know whether or not blogging along with writing popular textbooks and teaching Ec 10, which might occasionally be in Sanders, is a good thing too. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's, it's a delight uh, to be here. To be honest, I'm a little surprised at finding myself here talking about sort of new technologies because while I'm uh, not quite a Luddite, I am usually a, a late adopter of technologies. I remember back in 2003 uh, still writing my books in WordPerfect for DOS. And I think I was the last person on earth still doing that. I know there are many lawyers who are still <laughs> persisting. Uh, I think if I could get, get it back on my machine, I'd be delighted. Um, and in, uh, in my experiment with Facebook has not been all that successful. I don't have a Facebook account now, but I did briefly. I set up a Facebook account, and I really didn't know what to do with it. Um, but a lot of students around the world who were using my textbook kept wanting to friend me. And I said, oh, sure, why do you want to be my friend? Why not? So I just kept adding friends. I had these thousands of friends that I never met um, until I finally reached 5,000. I did not know this, but 5,000 was the limit of how many friends you could have. And then Facebook told me, I'm sorry, you can't have any more friends. <laughs> so... So I, I announced on my blog, which I'll turn to in a minute, that oh, I'm, so I'm going to say goodbye to Facebook. I can't anymore. The only thing I was doing with my Facebook account was adding friends, and now I can't do that. So what's the point? So I, I shut down my Facebook account. And, it, and within 24 hours, I got an email from the chief operating officer of Facebook <laughs> who said, uh, Professor Mankiw, uh, I read, read your blog recently. You may not remember me, but I remember you, taking you to faculty dinner <laughs> <laughs> some years ago. And she explained to me how I couldn't have a, what well, she explained to me technologically why they couldn't have more than 5,000 friends, but there's another thing, I had a fan page that I could set up, which I actually never bothered doing, but we'll so. We'll do it for you right now. <laughs> no, well, if only we had Wi-Fi. We so I, I wasn't sure why you needed this, so I, I, I'm still not on Facebook in any capacity. But what I am is, I am as a blogger, which I think is why I got invited to this thing, despite my, my somewhat Luddite um, tendencies. Now, that my, I'm sort of an accidental blogger. It actually came about 
uh, as a, a side effect of my teaching at 10, the large introductory course in economics at the college. And we have about 700 students, and I'm the lecturer. And so, as you might guess, I don't get to know, know the students one-on-one -on -one very much. I mean, do some, a few of them in office hours, but certainly not the vast majority. And so for the first year I did this, I tried to sort of do it via email, interact with them via email. And so when I would read a article in the newspaper that I thought was kind of interesting or related to something we were covering in class, I'd send them all an email saying, this is kind of an interesting article. Oh uh, what, what, you know, oh this is kind of related to what, to, to what we're doing. And I added three, three or four sentences and, and a link to the article. And I quickly learned two things. Um, one is a lot of students viewed, viewed me as the, the most notorious spammer in their lives. They thought it was, it was, it was information overload. Uh, but then in addition, I, I learned that some people who weren't in the class want, wanted to get the emails. I was getting, I was, you know, stu students who were in the upper level class said, I heard about your emails, Professor Mankin, can I get on your email list? I had professors at other schools who were teaching out of one of my textbooks saying, oh, we've heard about your emails, can we get on your email distribution <laughs> list? And so rather than doing it via email, I decided to switch the whole thing um, over to a blog format so that students who were interested in this um, uh, could uh, could access that, and, the, and other people who weren't at, at Harvard uh, could as well, and those who wanted to ignore it could as well. And so I think that's actually worked out uh, fairly well for me. When it started, it was basically um, my, my students and you know, a few other students at other schools and teachers at other schools. It, it, once the blog became known, though the readership expanded beyond that, um, I think I've roughly plateaued now. I get roughly 10,000 visitors a day um, stopping by uh, the blog. It depends a little bit on how much I'm posting, and if I post something particularly controversial that gets noticed on other blogs, it'll, it'll spike up. But 10,000 a day seems about, about the, a, uh, the average. And from the emails I get, I, I have some sense of what the readers are. There's lots of students from around the countries. I, I, I do have these two textbooks, um, in particular an introductory textbook that has a fair number of, of uh, students every semester. Also, teachers who teach out of the books will often use it uh, as a resource for getting ideas for their classroom or just sort of staying in touch. Uh, with the, the author of the textbook. And then also get a lot of, sort of economics junkies more broadly. Uh, and that includes uh, journalists, uh, Washington policy wonks. Um, uh, I even noticed that in his uh, uh, last book, Mitt Romney has a nice mention on my blog. So um, I do have a sort of a, sort of, sort of a wide eclectic um, uh, readership. Now the question is, what do I post there? Well, there's, there's sort of several things. And it's, it's really a wide variety of things. It's uh, the sub, I, 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 I very cleverly called it Greg Mankiw's blog. Uh, <laughs> so I couldn't think of any, anything else to call it. Um, but the subtitle is uh, Random Observations for Students of Economics. And that, if you look at what I post there, they really are very random and sort of eclectic. Um, I think by far the most common kind of post I, 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 I um, include are links to things I've seen and like. So an article I've seen, a cartoon I've seen, that was kind of funny if it's related to economics. Um, in I read, I read three newspapers every morning, and if I see something that's, I think sort of that a student of economics might want to read, uh, I sort of, and it's available on the web, I will post a link to it. The fact that the New York Times is now hiding behind a shield is actually very sad for me. Um, uh, but it, it, that does, so that, that cuts down sort of where I can farm but, um, for, for, for links. But I, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there that a few times a week I'll find something that a, a, a diligent economics student might, might want to read. Sometimes I'll actually do some work besides just sort of posting a link. I'll and I'll actually include some of my own commentary on recent events um, or recent uh, research, some article I've read, and I'll sort of summarize it or just post the abstract. And here's kind of a cool uh, a finding. Um, sometimes I'll include uh, information about my own life uh, for my very small number of fans out there. So if I have a new paper that I've pu published, um, I'll uh, sort of post a link to that, or if I, I'm giving a talk somewhere, you know, a couple weeks ago it was at the University of Cincinnati, and I know the University of Cincinnati was going was to web broadcast it, so I said, oh, if you want to hear, me, if you're not in Cincinnati, if you're in Cincinnati, you can come. If you're not in Cincinnati, you can sort of watch it live uh, via, via the web, and I'll post a, a link to that. Um, I'll post information about other economists, and in particular, my Harvard colleagues. So if we do students or other people are interested in what's going on at Harvard Economics Department, which is really one of the world's great economics departments, so I'll, if there's an article about them, um, one of my colleagues, I'll, I'll, I'll post that link. Uh, and indeed, I'll often alert to these links by my colleagues. I won't mention any names, but occasionally Professor X in the economics department will say, uh, you know, hey, Greg, um, I, this, this, this uh, magazine just pro uh, uh, gave it, wrote a profile about me. Here's the link. I'm happy to <laughs> post it on your blog. <laughs> and I, 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 always, I always oblige without actually mentioning that Professor X was actually the source of this piece of information. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, like a quick review of this. Guy. <laughs> we can get it's the called answer. grooming. Yeah. <laughs> Social grooming. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, the thing that's actually most popular, which I don't do a lot of, but it, it's, it's one of the most popular features I include is a link it, as, as advice for students. So I've had several students email me saying, you know, Professor Mankiw, uh, what um, math courses should I take if I want to th consider grad school in economics? Or I'm um, an undergraduate major in engineering, but I'm thinking about switching to economics. How, can I do that or, 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 or can't I? Or you know, if I'm a, I'm a freshman, I really want to be a great economist, what should I do in my summers? I mean, so sort of all sorts of random questions that a student might ask. And so I um, will answer those questions on the blog, taking, always take the student's name off, so I never include any student uh, names. Um, uh, and, and I actually keep on the, on the right side of the blog, there's, there's sort of permanent links of sort of advice for students. So those are sort of timeless in some sense. And not that many of them, but I think they're among the most popular things. And I know that because I get a lot of emails from students who read those things, who then want to g have a very, some very personal question. So I'd say two, three times a week, I get an email from some student around the world, not at Harvard, who wants to give me their life story and tell me what, what they should do next. Uh, it sort of becomes a little bit sort of the dear Abby of the economics profession. Um, and of course, it's hard to do because usually these questions are very personal and I sort of give them some broad things to think about, but I try to avoid giving very uh, personal pointed advice because I don't really feel um, capable capable of doing that. I also sometimes get questions from some more uh, popular figures, and then I will include their names if, if they give me permission. So, you know, David Brooks once asked me a question, the New York Times columnist, and so I asked David, he mind including his name when I answered his question? He said, no, that's fine. So I answered his question. He was asking about why it is that economists in economics departments seem different from economists in business schools when he talked to them as a journalist. So that's an interesting question. So that's that, that was something I answered on the blog. Um, so that's the kind of things I post, and it varies how much I post. Um, you know, ideally, from the standpoint of readers, they'd love to see something every day, but I have a, a, a day job, so I probably don't get do something every day, but I probably do uh, three, four, five uh, times a week. Now, there's, there's one thing about an, an, an attitude. I thought a lot about sort of thinking of the attitude of bloggers. Um, I, I happened to pick up recently a copy of Dale Carnegie's famous yeah. book, How to Win yeah. Influence and Influence People, which is actually quite a good book, actually. I'm starting to... It's, it's, very, it's amazing. Good book. Um, very, and, and very relevant today. It is. But in fact, as I was reading, in his first principle, the first thing he teaches in chapter one is don't criticize, condemn, or complain. <laughs> and, and he wrote this well before bloggers, but I kept thinking, you know, so many bloggers exist to criticize, condemn, and complain. <laughs> and I, I, I've, I've, I've um, tried to avoid that. I've tried to keep a positive attitude. And I, I know another blogger, by the way, another academic blogger, not here at Harvard, um, who whose whole blog is, is pretty much criticizing a variety of people, whether it's journalists uh, telling, telling the New York Times which journalists they should fire, or, or giving an award out for the, what, he, what he calls the stupidest man alive, for something he's read in the newspaper that he thinks is particularly idiotic. And he does it sort of regularly, and I think, I don't think Dale Carnegie would yeah. appreciate that. So I really try, I'm not sure, I'm sure I'm not perfect on this, but I try to keep the blog relatively upbeat. I try to post things that I think are kind of interesting, whether I agree with them or not, if they're interesting. If I think they're really stupid, I just ignore them. I don't post them. I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to point out, there's enough stupid stuff in the world that I don't need to sort of collect it. So I, um, I. Much less share it with anyone else, right? share it with anyone else. So I try to sort of just avoid that. Now, one interesting thing, if you're actually thinking about a blog, is comments. When I started my blog, I let people post comments. Uh, and originally, it was relatively small readership as Harvard students, a few faculty, you know, sort of, it was, it was a relatively elite group, and the comments were really very good. Over time, as I got 10,000 readers and it became broader, the comments became much more heterogeneous, much harder to sort through. Um, some of them were in, in, insulting to other, other commenters or to the, the world at large or to Harvard or even me, oh, God forbid. Um, and some of them were, were, were spam, spam commenters or advertising some product and give the link. And the software wasn't very good at keeping those out. And so I eventually just shut down um, the comments feature of the blog, which is easy to do. Uh, some people uh, objected to that. Some people emailed me saying I should hire a student to edit, to moderate the comments. You can easily moderate these things. I didn't want to spend the time moderating, and I didn't take the blog so seriously as to bother hiring a student to moderate. That just didn't seem, didn't seem worth it. Um, so I, I, at this point, I don't have comments on the blog. Uh, and I, I noticed when I shut down comments, readership did not fall off very much. So I was, uh, or at all, all really, that I could detect. So that, that was a, a, a positive uh, surprise. Now, the last thing I'll just ask uh, is, is it worth it? Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, there's good things and bad things ab ab about uh, blogging. Well, the one, one uh, good thing is that my publishers love it. I, you know, I have these two <laughs> textbooks, and both publishers really think it's terrific for helping sell textbooks. They view it as a long online infomercial for my <laughs> textbooks. Um, now, the, the best thing about being a professor, uh, especially a tenured professor, is uh, that you basically don't have a boss. You basically do whatever you want. With, with, with a few exceptions, uh, nobody's going to tell you how much time to spend doing research, how much to spend time teaching. 
uh, advising political candidates, writing op-eds, writing textbooks, blogging. You basically have complete freedom to do whatever you want. But the worst part of being a professor is you have complete freedom to do whatever you want, and you've got to figure out how to allocate that time, and nobody really gives you advice on it. So I'm not really sure if it's a good use of time. I don't spend that much time doing it, but it does take some time. I view it as a way of participating in the broader public discussion of economic policy and economics education. Uh, and in that sense, it's sort of complementary with, say, the op-eds I write month on a monthly basis from the New York Times or the textbook writing I do. Um, but it has an opportunity cost uh, like other things, and I think it's a, it's a tough call to know in the end of the day whether it's worth the opportunity cost. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. Just two brief uh, words by way of uh, segue to uh, Michael Sandel. The first is one thing I heard you describe, which just might be a concrete suggestion for others, is that you do a lot of work in the blog that you either don't have room or time for in the classroom, the kinds of things that you can do um, that would be useful to students and to the public, but just isn't sort of part of the main curriculum. It's an extension in that way. But then secondly, which is something I think is a good segue um, to Professor Sandel, is it's one way that you're dealing with the scale of your audience. Your audience is larger than many other teachers, frankly, um, and you have to figure out how to manage that conversation in a way it seems like you are bridging that both in the public and private through the space, which is really interesting. Oh, let me say something about scale. I also use it as a way to reach out to journalists. If there's some, if there's some piece of information in the news where we're going to have 20 journalists call me and ask me the same question, I might, in the blog, say, some journalists asked me this question and answer it right there. And then so all the journalists can, read, 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 can read, read, read on the blog rather than having to answer it 20 times. Very helpful. All right, Michael Sandel. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, John. I, I remember you when you were sitting no. in the back. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> you think I didn't notice. We've, um, with the, um, the justice course, we've done an experiment in uh, two parts. The first part of the experiment, which took us several years to work out, was to make the entire course including the, the videos of the classroom experience, me lecturing, but also the students responding, uh, freely available online and on public television. Uh, and the, the goal of that part of the experiment was to open access to the classroom, uh, to make it available as an educational resource to teachers, to professors, to interested viewers here and around the world, and to see um, how, close, uh, how closely we could replicate online the experience of actually being there. I don't think it's, it will ever be possible to replicate the uh, experience of teachers and students sitting together um, and learning online. But we wanted to see how close we could come. And so, um, we, uh, and the underlying idea was uh, to treat education, what we do here in the classroom, as a public good, to make it freely available and let people make whatever use of it uh, they wanted to. Now, I was going to uh, show the website that now contains the videos and the discussion blogs and the uh, polling devices that invite further discussion that present challenge questions after the viewer offers his or her opinion on whether it would have been right uh, for the sailors stuck at sea to kill the cabin boy in order to survive. But I don't want to, if, I'm sure if I try to show that now, I'll disrupt what we've just uh, put up there. So I'll save that for later, and if this works and if time remains, I'll show you a little bit of what we've created online. It's available at uh, at, at the, new, the new version, the new and improved version is available, about to be launched at justiceharvard.org slash preview. And uh, we'll take a quick look at it and some of its features, if time permits. But I want to speak about the uh, second uh, part of the experiment, which is beyond uh, Harvard providing a public service by filming in high-definition broadcast quality an entire course with student discussion and providing discussion guides and polling questions and all of that. Beyond dispensing stuff to the world, um, this seems to me a great opportunity to uh, see what we in turn can learn and how the education we provide our students can be improved in virtue of the engagement that we're able to generate and inspire 
uh, by people who take up this material elsewhere. Um, so what we can learn uh, collectively is the second part of the experiment. And um, the, the time is now ripe for this because of a, few, a couple of years now since we've launched it, it's uh, been taken up in various parts of the world. In China, they block YouTube, which is one way they would have had access to it. JusticeHarvard.org, they say they don't have the bandwidth or it would be very expensive to download it. But they, we made the videos embeddable so anyone can embed them freely on any website. And we've learned, we found that a number of Chinese uh, versions of YouTube um, have embedded the videos. We were thinking of a translation project, but before we could even muster that, the lectures appeared with Chinese subtitles, and millions of viewers have been uh, uh, watching the, the class in China. So this is an opportunity, not just, as I say, to dispense stuff to the, to the rest of the world as a public service, though we wanted to do that, but also to uh, create, uh, going back to Dana's phrase about the internet, to really see if we could make what we could do with this new kind of public space. And to uh, conceive this new kind of public space, not just as a recreational or a social space, but as a civic space, a place for public discourse and civic education. That's the goal of the second phase, the second ambition, which intrigues me a lot, to see whether we can um, encourage a discussion about the topics. And since the justice course is about political philosophy, it's of special interest to see what different views and arguments and perspectives um, arise when people in very different societies and cultures take up these questions. All the more interesting if we can connect and bring together uh, for uh, live conversation um, students at Harvard with um, students and others who encountered this material and these readings and these videos elsewhere in the world. So what I would like to show you is a very early experiment that uh, we've just been able to do along these lines to create a, um, a video-linked global classroom where we took a small group of students uh, at Harvard, in Tokyo, and in Shanghai, and thanks to um, NHK, the Japanese Public Television Network, we did the first of what will be a, initially a series of six um, uh, live video-linked global classroom discussions on questions of ethics and political philosophy. Since they, uh, we had planned it some time ago, but then the earthquake and tsunami came. And so we changed the topic for the first one to be the, to focus on the ethical and global implications of the disaster in Japan. We discussed the future of nuclear power. We discussed questions of universal and particular identities, given the outpouring of sympathy from around the world for the people of Japan. Uh, will this have some staying power? Will it begin to rewrite the boundaries of human sympathy and concern across nations, or is it a one-time disaster-inspired thing? So uh, it's in, uh, for the most part, Japanese, but there are some subtitles, and the Chinese students, interestingly enough, ha has spoke English in this. But everyone had earpieces, so there was simultaneous translation. So if we can uh, take a look at this, you'll get at least a... A sample of this experiment. Kamonotachina Thank you for joining us. 
マイケル・サンデルですこれは日本で起きた大震災と世界の反応をテーマにした特別講義ですこの災害は人々にとって世界にとってどんな問題を投げかけているのか人間の倫理や価値観についてあの皆さん家族だったら守ると言ったんですけども日本は多民族国家ではないので国全体として一つのファミリーだっていう気持ちが強いと思うんです。と私は原子力発電の問題点の一つがあのリスクを負う場所と恩恵を受ける場所があの違っているということです。Uh,もし今ルソーが生きていたら YouTube でつなみのムービーを見てですね、えー、これは世界の果てのことではなくて自分の隣で起きていることだと思ったと思います。ですから今アイデンティティの問題と、えー、グローバルなものが対立するものだというふうにおっしゃってますけれど必ずしもそうではないと思いますね。In this age where communication is at the heart of the matter, I think that it is possible to,、uh, to sympathize with countries a half, a, half、um, a world away. And I think that it's important to note that、uh, in the case where there's a natural disaster,、uh, I think that sort of brings us together as a community. I am a little bit skeptical, skeptical about whether we can really move towards a Identity of universal or global citizen, as we call.、Um, I felt a lot of pride in the humans that weren't looting, that weren't hoarding, and in kind of finding out information like this of things going on in Japan, of, of actions of the Japanese people, of you know, people that were acting as heroes, things like this. I felt a human pride. Congo. 日本の皆さんそして善意をもって支援をしようという世界中の人々がこの議論の中に何かを見いだしてくれればと願います参加してくれたみんなどうもありがとう So apart from shocking you about my recent acquisition of Japanese which I wish I had Uh, it's just,、um, I should have mentioned, there were, in addition to the students, they added in the Japanese studio some well known Japanese celebrities because this was not,、uh, this was also as a television program and they had to keep the ratings up and so on. So they, <laughs> but for future ones, we're going to put the celebrities to one side and let them comment after the fact, after the discussion. Among the students,、uh, plays itself out. This was an exception, partly because it was the first time, but also because right in the aftermath of the disaster, they all they, they wanted to,、uh, well, this, they wanted the celebrities to offer their views about the, the disaster and so on. So it's not quite representative, but it,、um, it's a, a first step in. What I think could be a fascinating、uh, project and experiment to build on the open、uh, access that we've created largely through the, the website and the internet to,、um, 
do more than just open access to the classroom as a public service, um, but to open up new forms of understanding and of deliberation and of, of civic discourse um, that reaches across universities and, for that matter, across cultures. Congratulations to you and also to Harvard for doing this. I think if we could figure out how to scale this kind of thing, obviously it seems like it's plainly a good for society and it's amazing to have you leading the way. Thank you. Um, I had, there are two reasons why Harry Lewis is going last. Um, the first one is I didn't have any idea what he was going to say, so if Harry could go last and do cleanup. But it, mainly it's because I couldn't think of anyone who could follow this list of speakers and actually uh, clean it up well. So, well, Harry. thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm not sure why I'm here either, except maybe <laughs> I, I've been around um, a long time. I think I'm the senior member of the panel. I'm, I'm so senior in this business that my email address is lewis at Harvard, which, uh, because, I, because I was a second year graduate student on the day when they gave out the first six email addresses. And it, and it was so cool because, you know, I could send an email and the guy on the other side of the room, who was also one of the other six, would, would say, yeah, I got it, you know. This is like, isn't this neat? So when did Scott Bradner get SOB? Yeah, they, they, we, we, were the, we were the same cohort. Yeah, it's Scott, Scott Bradner was a SOB at Harvard. And, and, I, and I, for some reason, picked, uh, picked, picked Lewis at Harvard. And, um, and I've been around long enough that, um, that I helped start Microsoft because Bill Gates, after taking my course, um, said, I'm out of here. I got better things to do. <laughs> And then, as incredible as that feat was, I then repeated it because Mark Zuckerberg did exactly the same thing. He <laughs> took my course and then, and then dropped out. And I do have to take a moment. I, I want to say, I, my section, if I'd given it a title, would be the ambivalent blogger. So I'm going to have some remarks about the ambivalent blogger. But I want to say a couple of things about social networking before we get there. And, you know, and one of them is, um, that the, the fact which John was referring to, that the original prototype of Facebook was in fact called Six Degrees to Harry Lewis. He, he actually wrote me in, in January of 2004 before, uh, before the company was incorporated and, and asked if he could display a little social network where the links were between people who were mentioned in the same Crimson story. And because I'd been dean, I had you know more links than anybody else did, and, and I had a very interesting reaction. I've, I've saved the email. This is a, I, I looked back to him. I wrote back to him, and I said, Mark, he could, he'd, I'd had him in class a, a year earlier, and I said, Mark, you know, it's all public information, so I suppose it's okay. But that somehow there's a point at which an accumulation of that many pieces little pieces of public information begins to feel like an invasion of privacy. That was my first reaction when Mark showed me this idea. And then he showed it to me, and then I wrote back and said, oh, sure, what the hell seems harmless. That was my, that was. You're right on both scores. <laughs> right, 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 right on both scores. Um, I, by the way, I have, I have the, um, the, all the Altair code there that they, those guys wrote. So I actually can count up lines and, <laughs> and tell you how many were written by Paul Allen and how many were written by Bill Gates and settled this once and for all because they left the listing. I want to say on the social, the one thing I want to say on the social networking thing, it was such a privilege to have Dana here giving that startup address. She is so good and she always has uh, ways of putting language around things about which I have these uh, vague, inchoate feelings. And the, the single scariest thing that I've heard today, and Dana is exactly right, that we may suddenly have a generation, thanks to my student, Mr. Zuckerberg, we may, find, we may actually have the first generation where going to college, actually, uh, you, you take your social network with you and you don't start over. You don't. My vision of college has always been that it's where you go to change, that it's about freedom, that it's about you know, social mobility, it's about intellectual mobility, it's about learning from you know, the, the world of ideas how to be a, a new human being and you know, recreating yourself. And um, I, you know, how's that all gonna play out if, if we take our whole social nexus with us and carry it with us forward? 
I, I suppose we're going to create new ones also, but I, I just think the identity formation thing, which I like to think of happening in college, maybe, maybe indeed be drastically changed. Okay, so let me let me quickly so we'll leave some time for uh, for comments. I want to make um, two points about why I'm the uh, the ambivalent blogger. I've had I've had two blogs. One. I started, which was associated with a course and a book, which were closely associated with each other. I've been teaching a, a course called Bits, which is kind of about um, the, some social and legal issues in technology, information technology, and some of the technological underpinnings uh, that's actually taught in the quantitative part of the curriculum. And, there, and I wrote a, a book along with uh, two co-authors, Hal Abelson and Ken Ledine, called Blown to Bits, Your Life, Liberty, and Happiness After the Digital Explosion, and, and uh, started a blog associated with that. And then um, after a few, and, and that sort of became, uh, you know, I would, as Greg does, stuff associated with what I was teaching, I would dump out there and I would raise questions and, and link to New York Times stories, which you can't do uh, effectively anymore, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so on. And then um, at some point I got restless uh, from the confines of that subject matter because I liked also to comment on um, higher education. Um, unlike Greg and Dale Carnegie, I have no trouble complaining about other people on my blog. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, so I've, I've broken off and started a new blog, um, Bits and Pieces, which unfortunately hasn't really found an identity yet. And, uh, and I've been trying to struggle with why I'm not as motivated to, to keep these blogs going as I, as I was for a while, because it is work. And I think there's two, there's two um, points I would make about it. One is that um, this blogosphere world and the act of blogging is um, kind of, uh, I'm having a hard time with the, um, with the degree of bakedness of my ideas and my words. So, so I, I, I kind of like to control my ideas, not, not that I don't like to share them, that's not what I mean, but I like to actually get them right before I, before I show people. And, um, and I certainly like to get my words right before I show people. So when I, if, I, if I publish something and it's got bad grammar or an inept choice of words or something that one of my members of my family who are you know, you know, good language critics will, will, uh, you know, will complain about, I'm embarrassed. I mean, I'm like, you know, I'm a Harvard professor. I should write well. And you know, I hate putting dreck out there for, uh, for the whole world to see, even if it's in a kind of experimental thing. Now, this may, it may be an age thing. I mean, uh, there, there are other people. Uh, you know, David Weinberger has written an entire book as a public act, I, 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 it's an astonishing thing. You know, oh, here's chapter two, da 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 da. A week later, oh, I've just torn up chapter two. You know, <laughs> and 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 people are helping him tear it up and start over and so on. I don't know. I I I'm fi I'm finding it a hard time working that. I don't know whether it's a mat my personal uh, pride, which I should get over, or or what it is. But there is a a a, a, a an issue there about. Um, Control of words and ideas, and perfection of words and ideas, which um, which the the public nature of uh, of blogging challenges. I guess that would be that would be one thing. And then the other thing is the is that is really the, related to the comment that you talked talked about about the classroom. So um, one of the wonderful things about blogging is that it expands your audience to beyond your academic blogging I'm talking about, to beyond your Harvard College classroom. And in particular, um, I uh, have been teaching this course simultaneously as a distance education course through the Extension School to an audience that is around the world, which has really been wonderful. I mean, you know, to, to be to be uh, teaching about uh, censorship, and you know, I have students in China and Russia and other other places. The first set of lectures, you know, people in Saudi Arabia couldn't get them, and you know, it was really kind of cool. So, so the, 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 you know, so there was this there was this great thing. Unfortunately, it turned out that there was no effective way to get the distance. This is a, a matter, a local, you know, uh, uh, temporary question of Harvard technology, but you couldn't. You know, the, the, the Harvard uh, blog site didn't want outside people in it, and the extension school students were outside or something like that. So we moved the whole thing outside Harvard to, to, to run the discussion group. And, um, 
And then, of course, once we, I started running it on this, on my, my Bits book blog, um, we started getting, uh, you know, other people from the, who were not uh, students either in the college or the, in the extension school who were also participating in the conversation. And it was good, but it wasn't all good, okay? It wasn't all good. You, you, you lost your sense of intimacy somehow, of your, the intimacy of your relationship with your, uh, with your students as you were dealing with them on a, on a day-to-day basis. So the question of, where the, of, of walls and inside and outside and the permeability of these communities is, again, it, it, it's something that, I, uh, that I've struggled with and, and I think is uh, sort of holding me up to figure out exactly in what form I'm gonna, you know, gonna, gonna reinvent this. Uh, the whole thing eventually came uh, crashing down, actually, because um, because I woke up one morning to discover that the Google alerts on my new blog entries were laced with Viagra ads, and uh, and this actually turned into a very interesting computer science research project, which I, I, I found some colleagues at another university who were really interested in in uh, in taking on, but. Um, there are uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the blogging process can be undercut by external forces. I guess that would be the only uh, the only way thing I would say by by way of conclusion. I think that's about all I have to say. Um, we should use the rest of the time for questions. Just to ensure the right number of mics, I'm going to stand over here during the questions. And as you um, gather your thoughts, I wanted to uh, throw one question open to the panel. Um, one thing as I was listening to this discussion is it reminded me a lot of a conversation I'm having with people like Gosha and other colleagues in the library community. We are in the midst of reimagining the Harvard Library. And one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how to align very closely the way we restructure it with the teaching and learning and um, uh, kind of outreach uh, mission of the university. I wondered, um, so many of the themes are the same ones we're talking about in this process. I wondered if you had any thoughts about things that you might say to the library community, 1,100 people, $180 million that we spend uh, on libraries that might help meet some of the um, challenges or issues that you've, you've raised as we go along. And then you can all be thinking about uh, a few questions after that. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not, it's a hard question. You know, let me say something about my field. Uh, most e economics these days is, is communicated via journals. So I as an economist, I find myself going to libraries far less than I did when I was, say, a grad student. Because basically, all journals are online. And if you guys give me access, you know, as, long as, as long as you pay the right fees, so I get every, all the journals through, through the Harvard Library website, I never need to go into a physical uh, library anymore, and I suspect that's true of a lot of people in my field. Now, my guess is it's less true of historians who are looking for dusty old volumes, but but, yeah. but, but, but Google's going <laughs> to yeah. probably solve but, that but problem. Still, but, yeah, but, over but, time. Some of it. Over yeah. time it will, yeah. some of it. But, 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 the, but the, the comments you made about the New York Times is just the leading edge of yeah. what's going to be, I mean, how do you, how do you blog yeah. about, you know, an article that you can only get through JSTOR, which, you know, we're yeah. privileged enough yeah. to get, but, yeah. the, but not everybody is. And, 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 and you know, and, but as an educational issue, also, it's a really, it's a really interesting problem. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a spin on this. So I'm teaching a freshman seminar where, where uh, students are writing historical papers and uh, using um, materials, a lot of which they can find online, but not all of it. And many of them are using Harvard Archives because they're writing papers. It's, actually, it's, it's a seminar about sports history, actually, the sort of social history of sports in America. And there's wonderful archival materials that they can get to, except for the fact that the archives, because of the library's contracting budget, open only late in the morning now, and my students all have sports practice in the afternoon, <laughs> and therefore, they were very unbelievably nice. They started opening early just for my students, but there is a, there is a tension here. Good, uh, user centricity <laughs> is one of our new principles. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, I, I would uh, give one overriding piece of advice or uh, asper a suggestion, aspiration, which is in the wake of the, the Google settlement mm -hmm. being rejected by the court, to take the opportunity to create. Uh, the Harvard Library is a national treasure. Let it be a, a universal public good, along with the other major research libraries. Google had a good impulse to scan and make available all of this, except that it wanted it to be proprietary. So let's see if we can't do the same thing. Maybe with Google's help, they've scanned an awful lot of stuff. They could get a lot of credit. 150,000 volumes of which are ours. 
Right. Well, yes. Then let's, let's which we should have scanned and just put up on the web ourselves, <laughs> rather than having Google come in and do it. Let's let's make all of that. See if we can join with other major libraries around the world and with foundation help if necessary and enlisting Google if we can to, to make it a universal, universally accessible public resource. The good news is the Sloan Foundation has given us a grant to do precisely that. We have a bunch of uh, other universities and uh, in fact the Library of Congress and many others joining us and Google's at the table. So we'll enlist your help in precisely this, but thank you for the uh, encouragement. Can I say one, add one fact? Yeah. No, one economics journal, the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity, has just announced that they're going to be open access. So they basically let their whole archives are now free to anyone without any password or anything. Now, which I think is a great thing, but yeah. that, it's, that's unusual because it's a, it's a journal that's published by a nonprofit. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the journals in economics, and I think other fields as well, are published by Elsevier, and they don't seem to have the same uh, motives <laughs> as the nonprofit organizations do. Well, that's my second advice is just that to break the uh, hold that these uh, journals have on, on library budgets and uh, break their monopoly by having all of us put out our articles, of, of, of make them freely available. Thank you. It's a great encouragement. Please. does create a different space for you to interact with your students. And what I'd really like to hear is lessons learned. And over the course of time, have, has there been a time when it's been uncomfortable for any of you online with your students? And time management also becomes a huge portion of this, because someone said that you are expected to be 24-7 online. And there are real elements of truth to that. So how do you, there are many fuzzy changing boundaries. And I'd, I'd just like to hear about people's experiences with that. Thank you, and in the spirit of time management, I'm going to suggest that we'll stack up a few questions, then you guys answer them, and we'll move over to, to Perry. Uh, Dana had her hand up over here, I think. I guess I was just going to ask why, like, you know, I love all the experimentations, and you're, to your point about the open access issues, why should Harvard faculty, full professors, even publish or review or otherwise engage with closed access publications at this point? You have the ability to set the stage, especially the, the folks who are post-tenure, so why, you know, what advice would you give to... You save this faculty? provocation for 158, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Bergen, and then we'll do one in the back. Thank you. My question is similar to John's, except from the perspective of uh, university IT. How have all these emerging uh, tools changed what you expect from IT and what you think IT should provide to help professors use these tools in teaching, learning, uh, research, scholarship? This is from the director of iCommons, importantly. You have a, a so, captive audience So I should preface here, so, my yeah. question. Tactfully speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, last question do? is just by the door in green, and then we'll, uh, you guys can take whichever ones you'd like. This is mostly for Professor Sandel, but I'm interested in how you tracked the use of your project, how you found out who was using it around the world, and then connected with them. Thank you. Um, so maybe we'll start with Professor Sandel and then end with Professor Kane, right, if that's two okay. Two quick answers. I don't know. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> But Ann Cushing, if she's here, uh, knows. What's the answer? And um, let's see, iTunes. And, uh, Great. So, for who is not, who, if you were not on the microphone for people, the, the answer was Google Analytics, Perry Hewitt, and iTunes YouTube data. And just uh, my uh, quick answer to uh, Dana, my answer would be yes. I agree. We shouldn't. I mean, we, yeah, we should just publish, and we should break the monopoly of the proprietary journals. There's no reason why not. No. Professor Lewis, you're on. We're going down the line. No, it's all right. I'll pass. All right. Okay. Um, on the on the open access thing. The reason is basically that when to choose what journal to submit to, one's looking for your, for your private self-interest and not the social interest. And professor wants to get his paper published in the most prominent journal, which is historically determined. And whether that journal happens to be private or, or, in a non, or in a nonprofit is, doesn't really enter the professor's calculation. Now, one, one hopes that over time, the open access journals will become better known because they're easier to read and they're open access. And therefore, they'll t get a higher market share. But I don't think we're, we're going to count on the um, lack of self-interest of the, of the professors. Where One way to bridge these else. two answers is that increasingly citation counts may be going that's up right. for citation, open access. There's some evidence for that. There is early evidence, yes. exactly. So, so I think that might. On student privacy question, I think that's an interesting thing. To the extent we use these media uh, in the classroom, we have to be very mindful of that. Uh, when I started my blog, I had uh, uh, you know, students used to post uh, comments, but I back, back, back when I still, st still had a comments uh, section. Uh, and one student actually put his first and last name on the comments, and then six months later he said, 
oh gosh, I'm kind of sorry I had all those th comments in the public domain that with, with my name associated with it. Now if some employer wants to look at my, my comments, I realize that some of them were stupid. So uh, uh, he asked me to take them down. Actually now I've taken all the comments down, so, so uh, he's been saved. But I think if we are going to use these things, we have to sort of do protect student privacy. I, 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 love, I love the comment earlier where they said that the classroom is supposed to be a protected place where people uh, feel, feel safe to say stupid stuff. And to the extent we, we, we open these things up, we don't, want to, we don't want to compromise that. It's a wonderful point. Nancy, can you get the last word? Okay, a couple of comments. Um, I think we're going to have to do a lot more teaching and modeling around these issues of the blurring of public and private. I mean, we have business school students that have come up through Facebook now, right? And they don't understand that, oops, you might not want employers to read about this on your Facebook page. So even at 26, we need to be thinking about the P's and Q's, right, and rules of the road just for your own, you know, dignity and, 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 and reputation, solid reputation. So we're going to have to take that on. Um, I've forgotten your name, Mr. IT? Paul Bergen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. IT, well, I said Mr. IT. Mr. IT, I think, honestly, I think, you know, I have watched from being a research assistant when we were, like, programming mainframes in the first floor of Baker Library, I have watched your empire grow and expand and become central to what we do. And I, I watch our, our, our senior faculty particularly, our influential silverback gorillas, struggling with, with the mechanics of IT and yet wanting very much to, 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 especially in a very pragmatic place like the Harvard Business School, to be in the traffic with their students. So I think you're going to have to become even more of a teaching institution as opposed to an emergency response center. Mm. I really do. Nice. I really, really do. Nice. And you're very important in the latter, but the former is becoming very important. Um, one last word on silverback gorillas and, and private source journals. So there's another piece of this, which is about citations and prestige, right? That's very, very important, even though you have this anachronistic but eminently desirable tool of human resource management called tenure, right? There's another piece, and that is that at least in, at HBS, we have an enormous number of senior faculty that are working with junior faculty. And, and, and those citations for junior people climbing the ladder are critically important. And until, to Greg's point, you know, the academic journals, become, prestigious academic journals with great influence, right, become open source, right, our promotions model, our influence model is outdated by, is, is, not, is not keeping t tabs with the possibilities and the noble right, potential of open access. So we got a rub there that we don't quite know how to, to iron out. I'm on the library, I just got appointed to the library committee, John, so we're gonna, I'm, I, don't, I don't have any answers, but I'm, I'll be there in spirit and earnestness. But, but, but all You're the thrilled. people who cite us are also members of the same guild. The they is us. No. <laughs> the guild is still, is breaking down, but it's still not broken, yeah. right? Nor is the promotion system for the young. Well, I think, um, Professor Singer, you see that there is much more here. There are many hands that I'm ignoring, tactfully or tactlessly, um, at this moment. But I hope you will all uh, join us in thanking this truly wonderful panel. <laughs>